So welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us and I'm incredibly delighted and happy to have Sarah Sands, the editor of the Today programme with us today, to talk very specifically about the role of the Today programme at a time of national crisis. I asked Sarah to do this seminar at the start of April when just as we'd gone into lockdown and it was clear that we were living through an unprecedented time. Come this week, it's become incredibly pertinent and even more um, time sensitive than it was then. We will stick with the usual format, so I'll hand the floor over to Sarah. Please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off. And if you've got questions, type them into the chat box and I'll, I'll um, read them out to her at the, after her presentation. Everything is on the record as well for this as well. So thank you. And thank you very much, Sarah. Sarah is somebody I realized I worked with her at the Daily Telegraph under Charles Moore, and she has been editor of two newspapers, two national newspapers, the Sunday Telegraph and later the um, the London Evening Standard as well, and she has been a kind of one of the leading women editors of our time and, and has uh, had a bird's eye view of British politics for a very long time. So thank you very much, Sarah. And over to you. Thank you so much, Mira, and um, good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining the session. Great to be in Oxford at the Reuters Institute, albeit virtually. Um, I shall lay out some thoughts and then be very happy to have a question and answer session after that. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the works of the Conservative MP, Edward Arger. I'm sure he's done many important things since he became a health minister last September. He's really busy now. But he's not what you would call a household name, except in the Today programme household. At 10 past eight on February the 29th, he became the first government minister to appear on the BBC Radio 4 morning show since Boris Johnson's election victory last December. After two and a half months, the government called off the boycott of the programme that it had put in its place the minute it won the election. Mr. Arger's appearance was one of those many unexpected consequences of the COVID epidemic. The virus achieved what had begun to seem impossible. It brought government ministers back in front of UK's major news audience. Since Mr. Arger appeared in the studio, barely a day has gone by without a minister. At the start of the boycott, a government insider accused us of talking only to a pro-Remain metropolitan bubble. What they were signalling was a clearing of the Augean stables. The Today programme must be punished for interviewing some of those Remainers, they used to be called members of the, cabinet, of the government, in the run up to the election. But it turned out our reach went a lot further than that after all. The Reuters Institute has labelled today's talk the role of the Today programme in a national crisis. I guess I should start with a health warning. This half hour is largely based on what scientists call observational research, which is to say, I've watched what has happened and written a lot of it down. There is a problem about the objectivity of this method, of course, for I am a player rather than a disinterested observer. I present this as a small, largely anecdotal contribution to a much bigger ac academic and political debate about the role and indeed the politics of the BBC. That bigger debate has raged since the general strike in 1926. I do not presume to discuss the whole BBC, first because I work in a small corner of the empire, second because we are too much in the middle of things now to come to firm conclusions, third because I'm still there, at least until September. I hope that's not too disappointing for you. There's no shortage of commentators, many of them taking BBC pensions, funnily enough, who do not feel so inhibited. So today, I'd like to talk about how we at the Today programme see our role, the editorial decisions we take, and the extent to which we are left to take them ourselves. Because this crisis is so closely tied to the government and its response to it, this is a health and economic crisis that's developed a strong political element. I'm also gonna talk about how we fell out with the government, how the relationship was patched up, and whether it will last. First, a little explanation of the Today programme. In the BBC's own words, we are the flagship news programme on British radio. We are, and I'm quoting from the advertisement to find the person who will do the job after me, the BBC's primary newsmaking outlet, extending its insights and expertise across the widest range of topic areas, scrutinising events and key decision makers, and making full sense of the changing UK and world. There are a few phrases in there to bear in mind. Newsmaking insights and expertise, and scrutinizing key decision makers. 
scrutiny is a word we just heard from Keir Starmer, by the way, this morning. Not an attack, scrutiny, he said to Boris Johnson. We reach about 7 million listeners a week. The number tends to move up and down depending on what's in the news. Generally, more people come in at the start of something big and move out again if it goes on so long that they start to find it boring. Brexit was perhaps the clearest example of that. Covid is in danger of becoming another. Our listener numbers are up at the moment. That may not last, but while Covid is more encompassing than anything else, it doesn't change much from day to day. People get out of bed later in lockdown and it's pretty depressing news, particularly when it's been so sunny outside. I came to edit the show three years ago, a wild card appointment as a BBC outsider. My brief was to get bigger and more varied voices on, to make the Today programme more noticed, to have it set the news agenda. I'd spent 30 years in newspapers, and I soon noticed the difference between the papers and the BBC. Not so much in the journalists, journalists are pretty truculent and demanding wherever you go, but in the corporate attitude. The thing about newspapers is that, unless you do something so wicked that it breaks the law, what you publish is nobody's business but yours and your readers. The thing about working for the BBC is that whatever you broadcast is everybody's business. Newspapers have agendas. Newspapers are biased. Left, right, upmarket, downmarket. Readers are self-selecting. They come to a title knowing what to expect and wanting it. The BBC is not biased. What I reckon it does have, having been an inside for three years, is a slightly wistful impulse towards social cohesion. It desperately wants to do the right thing. It likes community rather than sowing division. And this can mean a wish to police language. Mischief makes papers happy. Mischief makes the BBC anxious. The anxiety is exhibited in many different ways. We saw it last week in the BBC's response to a monologue by Emily Maitlis at the opening of the BBC late night news show, Newsnight. The BBC decided she'd stepped over the boundary between news and comment. I remember at the start of my new job, a conversation with the Princeton historian, David Canadine. He warned me that the BBC's relationship with government is inevitably paranoid. The government controls the money which leaves the BBC anxiously asserting its independence. The BBC needs to assert that independence, for government is quick to seek control. When I arrived, I was surprised to discover that a figure named Robbie Gibb, a BBC editor who had become Theresa May's media spokesman, expected not only to choose the minister we might interview, but also the time at which the interview would take place. When I explained that I believe those decisions were for me, and that on this occasion we would be perfectly happy without a minister, he sounded cross. Within hours, the first complaint from Mr Gibb was on its way up the news hierarchy. Happily, no one suggested I'd change our commissioning style. By last December, of course, Mrs May was long gone and Robbie Gibb newly knighted with her. If the government of Theresa May was sometimes irritable with us, the anger was mild compared with what followed. On election night, December the 12th, the climax to an occasionally fractious election campaign I discovered that the next Conservative administration believed that we were too big for our boots. I texted the number 10 press office that night to ask if my old Daily Telegraph colleague, Boris Johnson, would be coming on the programme to discuss his resounding victory. The response came at 2.38 a.m. We won't be putting anyone up for the programme. Next morning, when I noticed that the Minister James Cleverly was doing the rounds of the TV studios, I realised the ban was aimed specifically at us. I texted number 10, how's the spirit of healing going? In the days that followed, it became clear that the boycott was serious. A former colleague close to the new administration explained the philosophy. It was, they said, from the Trump playbook. The government had a big majority. It felt it could lay down rules on media engagement. It had its feet on our windpipe. It was taking the opportunity to diminish the power of the BBC. I discussed that insight on Radio 4's feedback programme, after which a number 10 source briefed a response to the Mail on Sunday. The Today programme is irrelevant. It's not a serious programme anymore, so we're not going to engage with it. On December the 31st, China alerted the WHO of a pattern of cases of pneumonia in Wuhan. So Robbie Gibb wrote an enthusiastic support of the ban in the Daily Mail on January the 4th, 
My remarks on feedback had been extraordinary and unfortunate. The programme was haughty, miserable and monstrously out of touch. Funny thing was, several ministers texted me to say they did not agree with the policy. They wanted to come on, but... One explained that we were in the doghouse for having the wrong kind of guests and of listeners. Too many academics, too many bosses, too many experts. Funny how the nation has regained its appetite for that last group. I started to doubt myself, but I had a drink with a business friend, the former CEO of one of our biggest companies. He listened to the Today programme and he followed politics, but he had not realised that there was a boycott. He was shocked. You're not going to give in, are you? You absolutely must not give in to them. Another former cabinet minister texted me, number 10 at their strongest now, so don't give too much away. Best wait until they hit rougher waters and need to explain themselves. I talked to a, to a former prime minister who encouraged me to hold out. And I had a call from a friend at the French embassy who could not believe what was happening. They said in France, the boycott was discussed with incredulity. On January the 23rd, the Chinese government puts Wuhan in lockdown. On January the 24th, Matt Hancock comes out of a Whitehall meeting and announces that the risk to the British public is low. Some figures outside the BBC suggested I should throw myself at the feet of number 10, but I did not intend to beg for forgiveness. We did not regard ourselves as being with war, at war with number 10, so I saw no reason to sue for peace. We had done nothing wrong. Management at the BBC were entirely supportive, though I wouldn't have blamed them for feeling a little bit irritable for I don't think I'd shown much interest in any programme beyond our own. The perceived dominance of the Today programme can certainly annoy other outlets. One thing I tried to encourage at the Today programme was an enhanced civility and consideration to counter the reputation for arrogance. The good thing was that I came under no pressure to make any accommodation with government. So it's nice to have that internal support, but I was starting to feel a little lonely. I was meant to get big names on the show, was meant to set the news agenda, but was unable to put up members of the government. They'd made the calculation they could reach their audience through social media and less challenging programmes, and eventually it would work. An American official told me that the Today programme was considered essential listening to them, but if we went too long without any government representative, they would need to think about recommending some other outlets in order to find out what Downing Street was thinking. In many ways, I could see their point, what was in it for them. There's no rule saying government ministers have to come on the radio. Why come on the Today programme and be challenged by an interviewer when you can put a picture of Dylan the dog on social media? Why submit to interviews with a journalist when you can conduct your own in-house? You could regard journalists as a necessary part of the democratic process, my own view, or an annoying barrier between you and your audience, your voters. Maybe the voters don't want challenge because they've already made up their minds. Before we go on, perhaps it's helpful to explain the setup at the Today programme. The programme goes out for three hours a day, from Monday to Friday, and two on a Saturday. There's an assumption that we have a highly staffed organisation within the BBC. We're happy for people to think that, but the reality is different. We have a team of about 40, including around three reporters who work primarily for the programme. There are four presenters who work rotors based on three shows a week. The news bulletins come from the BBC News Department, the sport from the BBC Sports Team, business from the Business Department, with some consultation. Oh, and Thought for the Day, which comes from the Religious Affairs Unit. So the reputation of the programme is based on the items we choose to cover, the people we interview and what they say. The presenters arrive each day in the small hours, spend a couple of hours before the programme to master briefs written for them by a talented and hardworking team of overnight producers. The presenters need to be barristers, journalists and entertainers. It's a demanding job. And when the programme finishes, they go home and the next rota of producers get to work setting up interviews and reports for the following day. There are no instructions from the BBC. There are daily inquests, some involving BBC management, on what we think we did well, what we could have done better, what was a disaster. What did we find out on that programme? What was the tone? Did we ask the right questions? How was the balance of guests? So if there's a problem with the show, it's down to me. And having no ministers is a problem. I said I would not beg, and I didn't. But I did go to Downing Street to see if we could find a way through. Serious issues were on the agenda. Floods, a big decision on HS2, Huawei. The Today programme seemed the right place to talk about them. 
Downing Street wondered what was in it for the government. We talked about interviewing styles. Downing Street wondered whether we were representing the view of the Red Wall in the North, the Labour seats that the Tories had won in the election, rather than university educated Southerners. I had a brainwave. In an attempt to look receptive to the new political map of Britain, without forfeiting independence, we would revert to the arrangement on the Today programme of the 1970s, in which Brian Redhead presented from Manchester and John Timpson from London. I reckon Nick Robinson, who is from Cheshire and had poignant personal ties to Brian Redhead, could be our voice from the North. Somehow the Sunday papers got wind of this brilliant plan and presented it as a done deal. Unfortunately, I had not gone around to discussing my proposal with the presenters. I quickly clarified the plan. When I had suggested Nick would be a friend in the North, I actually meant of the North. We did not know that reporting from anywhere would shortly become out of the question. On January the 29th, Chinese nationals at a hotel in York are reported to have fallen ill, the first coronavirus cases on British soil. Over the following month, coverage of the corona crisis increased by the day. We talked to doctors, to epidemiologists, I can, presenters have learned how to say that better, WHO officials, to the brightest minds we could find. They came on willingly and shared everything they knew. Everyone seemed happy to answer intelligent questions for an intelligent audience. Everyone, set the government. And something really interesting happened during those weeks. One of my guiding principles on taking the job was to have a programme from which people learn things. I remember listening to David Blunkett, the former Labour Home Secretary, a man who had overcome childhood poverty and blindness. He said he got his education from the Home Service, the forerunner of Radio 4. So I wanted clever people who knew things, who could share what they knew with a receptive audience, men and women, the more women the better, from science, medicine, the arts, business. I fear there can be a tendency to confuse this with elitism, that we pander to the middle classes to the exclusion of others. On the contrary, I think we are making excellence available to all. I wanted the Today programme to be the best that's thought and said across the world. And I wanted policymakers to be joined by those directly affected by those policies. Recently, we interviewed a Syrian refugee and filmmaker working for the NHS as a cleaner and questioning the surcharge he was obli obliged to pay for using the NHS. The government changed its policy within days. The key word I sought for the Today programme was enlightenment. And during those weeks without ministers, we achieved it. Suddenly, our interviews offered fascinating exchanges of real information. Ministers are always guarded when they come on. They've rehearsed the lines to take. They think success is just getting out a message. But now we were dealing with scientists and health experts talking about the growing problem of coronavirus without any need to be defensive, offering pure rational information and analysis. Several people remarked how much they enjoyed it. Listeners began to compliment the Today programme. Fewer pieces of crockery were being thrown at the radio. And yet, the government was beginning to take measures to combat the virus. Our large audience could reasonably expect to hear them come on and explain what they were doing and why. In the event, it was a Conservative MP who made the difference. The former Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, who turned down the offer of a ministry under Boris Johnson, was a guest at 10 past eight, generally regarded as the programme's most important slot, to discuss the growing crisis. He was informed, articulate, and as a backbencher, free from any political line. In other words, he could say what he thought. At the end of a wide-ranging and informative interview, we told the listeners that we'd invited a member of the government to come on, but that the government had declined to speak to listeners of the Today programme. There was a big reaction on social media, the gist of which was that Jeremy Hunt had spoken very well and that it was outrageous that the government did not appear. The next day, we were delighted to welcome Mr Arger to the studio. A former minister texted me as the interview went out, I can't believe you had to start a play to get government ministers back on the show. I've gone into the boycott at some length because I think it's impossible to discuss the Today programme's coverage of the crisis without that context. Over the years, many ministers, indeed prime ministers, have discussed their relationship with the programme. They tend to say their appearances on the Today programme have been challenging but necessary. Some of the bolder ministers are more positive. They were rewarding and even enjoyable. Many seem to regard an appearance on the programme and indeed an adversarial interview 
as one of the rites of passage of British politics. Perhaps current ministers will think that one day. They don't now. I'm conscious that whatever their personal views about the programme, they're coming on because the government has decided they have to rather than because they choose to. And you can see why we're not in the territory of feel-good announcements. So what is the proper role of a programme like ours at a time of national crisis? Are we to be a public information service, relaying whatever messages the government wishes to give, or to interrogate the science and the political decisions made on the back of it? Should we merely sit there and encourage successive ministers to repeat their mantra, stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives? At the beginning, there was certainly um, a demand from that from the audience and uh, noticed that even our weather presenters were starting to say, it's nice outside, but maybe you should be inside. I'm in no doubt about one thing. We have to continue to make the news. The BBC is often accused of taking its cue from the papers. One of the great satisfactions of the Today programme is having the newspapers follow us. We get interesting people saying interesting things and the papers report that. Sometimes they even acknowledge where the quotes have come from. Across the whole of the programme, I want our interviews to be a mix of examination, inquiry, and yes, the adversarial. Too many of one of these can become repetitive. I should say there's an intensely subjective element to this. What one listener regards as a challenging question, another hears as a negative impertinence. When we stop asking tough questions, we are accused of going soft. Here's The Guardian's John Crace writing on the return of ministers to the programme. The classic Dom he mentions is, of course, Dominic Cummings. We'll talk about him in a minute too, John Crace. Since the coronavirus outbreak, Team Boris has had to consider its refusal to send ministers onto the Today programme. Even classic Dom has been reluctantly letting ministers out into the wild from time to time. Not that the wild is particularly wild, more like a safari park, as the presenters are so thrilled ministers are no longer an endangered species that they now frequently forget to challenge them. In contrast, here's a listener's letter to the Sunday Telegraph. It's headed BBC Gloom. There is obsessive negativity in much of the media and particularly on the Today programme. Politicians are treated like imbeciles and everything they do is criticised. There is never a word of thanks on behalf of the British public for any of their successes. With this constant stream of bad news, it's not surprising that people fear for their lives and feel unable to leave their homes. Winston Churchill and the wartime media knew that in a crisis, the public must be given hope for the future. The same is true now. Raymond Humphreys, Cambridge, in relation to John Humphreys. What is the right way to talk to politicians? It's a question we ask constantly. There's a quote attributed to Jeremy Praxman who turned the adversarial interview into an art form when he was on BBC Newsnight. Why is this lying bastard lying to me? Interviews like that can be theatrical, but do they reveal anything? A generation of journalists has been brought up to believe in the gotcha question, the one that reveals that a minister is making things up or winging it. A generation of ministers has been brought up to find ways to avoid answering it. Piers Morgan, the former Mirror editor who now presents Good Morning Britain on ITV three days a week, has developed a hectoring, crusading approach that uh, puts him rather than the interviewee at the centre of the stage. It's been theatrical and the set piece bust ups have got very good traction on Twitter. But have we learned anything about what's going on? We're not likely to now that the government has decided the sessions are so counterproductive it won't appear on them anymore. A piece in the Times analyzes interviews and claims Emily Maitlis interrupts most every 28 seconds and our own Michelle Hussein is said to come in every 46 seconds. Both ask forensic questions. And I wonder if men instinctively try to talk over women. Michelle is quoted as telling Boris Johnson to stop talking. I remember that interview. She did so almost in despair when as foreign secretary in June 2017, he had turned questions about Donald Trump into an attack on labor. He told me afterwards that the women in his family had chided him for his behavior. Naturally, the BBC researches what his audience think of its output. I was struck by some around the middle of April, which suggested that the public generally thought our role was to support the government in enforcing the lockdown. And mostly it was wrong for us to challenge it. I think that's changing. Ah, oh, the lockdown. I said we would come to Dominic Cummings. His decision in going to Durham became a big story. 
Was it confected by the media or was there real anger? The post bag to Conservative MPs suggested the latter. He held his press conference. The, B the Prime Minister made it clear he wanted to move on. At what point should we stop asking further questions? What's the right balance between giving a minister time to discuss the initiative he wants to discuss and putting further questions to him about Dominic Cummings? In the Leave voting county of Nor Norfolk, where I live, a meme has been doing the rounds. Stay alert, the media is the virus. Keep safe distance from the BBC, Sky, Channel 4, ITV and The Guardian. I don't think we've always got the engagement right, but I do think we've been justified in asking hard questions. Issues such as care homes, supply of protective equipment, and promising promises of testing deserve repeated discussion. Our, pres our presenters work out the lines they wish to take from the briefings prepared for them. They have me or a duty editor in their ear to throw in an additional question prompted by an earlier answer, or if things are moving towards an unproductive, unproductive grudge match, to move them on. At the end of one particularly tetchy interview, the minister involved text. Do you have a moment to talk later? There must be a way for today to do better interviews than this. They phone later and complain that we carp about details, were people to return to work Monday or Wednesday and miss the big picture. What's the point? Why do you keep asking questions about what I said last week? Why not ask questions about what the public is interested in? What's happening now? I explain that these interviews are informed by substantial research. Our producers have compared what was said then and now and written extensive briefings for the presenter. This is how we hold their feet to the fire. They sigh, oh, and I've got pages of briefing preparation too. Why can't we just have a conversation? They preferred their chat with Chris Evans on Virgin Radio. Evans hadn't pushed them on protective clothing, had ignored issues about testing, didn't raise the failure to meet some of the timings promised the previous week. It asked a simple question, when can we go on holiday? The danger is that we can look, end up looking opposed to the government when we are actually merely asking questions of it. For several weeks, remember, we did not have an effective political opposition in this country. Now Keir Starmer is in office and asking interesting questions, we're more comfortable as interrogator of government and opposition. But our coverage is not all about politicians. When I arrived, I was eager to address the Westminster bubble issue. Were we too interested in talking about politics, often by having journalists who talk to each other about politics? My friend, the theatre director, Nick Heitner, warns his cast about too much fun on stage, which he says can become a conspiracy against the audience. Do we sometimes have too much fun in the studio? Over the crisis, we brought on a wide range of key scientists, many of them advising the government, some of them taking issue with those advising. Back in March, when Cheltenham was allowed to go ahead, Patrick Valance discussed herd immunity with us. If you suppress something very hard, when you release those measures, it bounces back at the wrong time. Our aim is to try to reduce the peak, broaden the peak, not to suppress it completely. Also, because the vast majority of people get a mild illness to build up some kind of herd immunity, so more people are immune to this disease. And less than a week later, a different message on the programme from Neil Ferguson, who developed a model that suggested herd immunity would lead to 250,000 or even 500,000 deaths. A tech zing zing from number 10. To be clear, this isn't a different strategy as reported. It was all in the original action. Neil Ferguson was back with us later, sounding a little hoarse. He told our listeners he was self-isolating with symptoms of the virus and that Westminster was awash with the virus. So it was, as the Prime Minister discovered. Sadly, Neil Ferguson left the stage after he was discovered to having breached lockdown regulations in pursuit of an affair. But he and other distinguished scientists, Paul Nurse, Patrick Valance, John Bell, David Nabarro, David Spiegelhalter, among many, have demonstrated again and again the joy of knowledge imparted in a way that lay listeners can understand. Follow the science is the mantra of the politicians, but what if the scientists are wrong, or at least partial? We have Robert Dingwall, Professor of Social Sciences, saying there is not one absolute view. Science is muddy. We have to respect scientists without unquestioning reverence for their views. The point about this virus is that we won't know until we look back at it. I love journalism at the moment, but I love it best when we can piece everything together in hindsight. And we're all anxious about the judgment of history. 
what unites the government and the BBC is their experience of inquiries. The joy of three hours a day on the Today programme is that we can go beyond the immediate health implications to explore other vital themes. It's stimulating to get people like the economist Jim O'Neill to talk about universal credit. We have Paul Tucker, former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, on how we could change things, the way we think about supply chains and globalism. Philip Hammond, former Chancellor, on the big choice, higher taxes or loading borrowing onto the next generation. Even a government min minister can, shows what can be done with a little imagination. Grant Shapps comes on to discuss how travel could be different in future. Maybe we rethink the Russia. And he does it without repeating the slogan, stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. And in commissioning coronavirus essays, we walk into an unexpected problem. I think we should be collecting an historical archive as we go through this. We have the playwright David Hare one day, Mary Wakefield married to Dominic Cummings the next. Suddenly, Twitter is alive with the disgrace of Wakefield being allowed to do thought for the day, our long-standing slot on religious faith. We explained that it was not thought for the day, uh, it was a much later slot in the programme, and the story goes away. Until Dominic Cummings is, explained, is discovered to have broken lockdown and the account by his wife too short of certain essential detail. I'm accused of being complicit in the cover-up. Just the hurly-burly of journalism. Coincidence is much uh, less, um, uh, sometimes much harder to explain than conspiracy. So what have we learned? Audience research has shown the BBC to be by far the most trusted source for information. Television audiences for the news breaking events have been astonishingly high. But as in the great Brexit debate, there tends to be polarization among the audience depending on political sympathies. Our high scores on impartiality and trust will suffer if we appear too soft on the government or too con condemnatory. The delicate middle ground is where we need to be. I read a note from a former editor of the programme. I don't understand why the BBC is not questioning whether we should be lifting the lockdown. You keep comparing deaths across Europe. Why don't you compare how low their daily infection rate is now is that enables a European country to lift lockdown? Surely with over 6,000 new confirmed cases, someone should ask, we went into lockdown too late. We are now lifting lockdown too early. And when it's clear that we do not have an effective testing regime. Well, I, I, first, I think we tested that question pretty rigorously, albeit from a neutral rather than a campaigning position. Second, there is a different view from those who have not enjoyed the job security of the public sector. A restaurant owner comes on to explain that his entire industry will go bust if we cannot break out. Remember, I speak as a relative newcomer to the BBC. I've been here three years and I'm out in September. But I think we've seen the different elements of the organisation rubbing along in classic fashion. The bureaucratic civil service mentality that keeps such a large, large vessel afloat. The show business side of stars and salaries. The Rethian reveling, reveling in its restoration as a voice of the nation on BE Day. And the journalistic team that wants to break stories and get news out. When we've got things right, it's been down to the professionalism and the hard work of the Today team, enhanced by those I call the friends at the Today programme, the best correspondents and their producers at the BBC. And the BBC has let us get on with it. When I look through the job description, which has attracted more than 100 impressive applications for my job, I noted the qualifications included openness and collaboration with other programmes and long experience as a programme maker. I text my boss to say I wish the BBC all the best and note that I don't actually qualify for the job. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Sarah. The really informative, um, very, very, very good to know. I have millions of questions and I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and ask some of them first and then I'll come to the chat. Um, just on the Mary Wakefield, I just want to push on one point. It's, do you feel you were misled by Mary Wakefield? And just to explain to everybody listening, you know, Mary Wakefield, who's the wife of Dominic Cummings and a um, editor at The Spectator magazine, came on to speak about her religious experience, how she prayed while she and her husband were kind of struck down with COVID while caring for a young child. And, you know, that, like you said, that wasn't the whole story. So do you feel you were misled in that? 
slightly, um, you have to think of what the purpose of these essays were. So that is this historical archive on people's experiences of COVID. So we've had people whose relatives had died. We had people working on the front line. We had, um, as I say, um, playwrights. We had Rory Kinnear on the death of his sister. So all these were about experiences. So in that light, for what the essay was for, um, it wasn't. What it wasn't. It was a news story. It wasn't relevant to the experience of COVID because it was about having. It was about having COVID. So in a way that the essay still stands, I think. Um, but obviously there was a news story attached, which we then you know pursued very thoroughly. Um, but it, but it was a different thing. So it but wasn't I done as a kind of news well. account of what of, of what she was doing. It was an experience of having COVID. So it, it served one purpose. We then wanted another purpose from, you know, so, so there was a key detail missing, I agree. For a news programme, I think. For no, news. You know, yeah, thank you. I'm going to go to the questions. And you're a visiting fellow for the Reuters Institute at the Reuters Institute at the moment. Um, and our other visiting fellows, Dorothy Byrne, who was um, head of news at Channel 4, Till very recently, and so I'm just going to ask her question um, here, to, you know, on, on in the spirit of having too much fun on stage, <laughs> um, and I, and on the day that it was announced that we had the highest number of COVID deaths in Europe, why did the Today program make Neil Ferguson breaking the lockdown rules the lead item on all the bulletins? And do you feel that the first story was more important, possibly more relevant to listeners? Um, First, just on the structure of the um, programme, as I explained, that the news bulletins come from come from a news programme. It was overnight, you know, the sort of the it, so what you're slightly looking for in those on those news bulletins is what's what news is breaking. Um, so I think that the two. So I think that um, Neil Ferguson breaking the lockdown, just as Dominic Cummings uh, broke the lockdown, you know, were both stories that attracted a lot of attention. I think you can do both. You know, I think there's a three hour programme. And so probably we would give much more time over the whole programme, which, you know, which we did to what was going on with the, um, the pattern of the disease and who was getting it and why. So I kind of think in terms of substance, um, you know, m more was dedicated um, to that subject on the what's the latest news? Have you heard that, you know, Neil Ferguson's broken lockdown? And as it happened, you know, that does then become part of a sort of recurring theme. So actually there is a sort of deeper resonance to it, as with Dominic Cummings is that, you know, why couldn't those people, so the people setting the rules, why couldn't they adhere to it themselves? It's quite interesting actually in um, Neil Ferguson's case, because he, he thought he might have immunity, which told you something about the disease itself, still being argued over whether you get it or not. So I don't think it was sort of irrelevant. It was the newest, it was the newest line of the day. Thank you. Um, you, you described the standoff with government um, in, over the boycott in incredibly kind of, you know, it's very violent imagery, the foot on your wind, wind pipe and don't give up now. And at one point you kind of, you, you said, don't throw yourself, you know, you were, you were told you wondered whether to throw ourselves at the feet of HQ, you know, you were told not to, not to back down, not to give in. What would giving in a capitulation have been in those circumstances at that moment when, when Downing Street were refusing to put up any ministers? Yes, I, I never, by the way, I never doubted that I, I would never have given in. Yeah. Um, it was simply that I was starting to sort of worry about what mm. kind of programme we would have. So it was the damage to the programme more. But um, what would giving in mean? To yes, a, I think well, in my case, it would be some sort of, you know, a, it would mean an apology, which I wasn't prepared to do. And, um, and some sort of... Um, um, understanding that we had to do things differently, you know, so I'm all for self-examination. I think it would be madness to say, you know, that we're sort of perfect. We can never, so we're endlessly discussing, um, you know, are we, um, are we approaching things in the right way? Are we getting to the truth and so on? But what I won't, what I can't have obviously is being told, um, you know, told ter the terms being dictated by, by the government. That would be, I suppose, a simple way of putting it. Thank you. Um, and related to that, a question from Kohei, who's um, our, one of our journalist fellows who's at NHK. And do you think that things after the pandemic, um, it'll go back to a boycott? Do you think politicians... That's a good point. Still... That's a good point. I don't know. But, they, but they, um, I, I don't know whether it will. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see. But kind of what I feel is that we, either way, you know, I'm, I'm sort of relaxed. I think, as I say, oddly, we found a way of doing journalism that became enormously popular. So that was the dividend um, of, of not having ministers. I think it's better to have ministers on. So I hope that we continue. But as it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, um, if, if they decide not to, that's up to them. Okay. 
And as a, as a kind of, as a female editor in chief here, do you, are you concerned? Uh, how can this question, Vicky Pollard, how concerned were you at finding that the women expert voices seem to dry up during the lockdown? Yeah, I think that is, I think that is a worry. And I think um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting point of the, 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 the lack of women. Um, during this. And I don't know if it comes back to, you know, what I've always found in general about um, um, getting women on, that, the, that you, there are two things that always um, you have to overcome. And one is, is, one is um, they're busy. Uh, they seem to be busier, <laughs> and particularly at that time of day. Um, and it's funny how we found that in the lockdown too, that women seem to be somehow busier, you know, and, and so it slightly depends what duties that you're doing, you know. Um, but also um, a sort of reluctance to put the head above the parapet. And I think that's a, you know, that's a problem for us all. Um, if that women feel that they, um, that they just don't want to sort of enter, you know, enter the arena with, with Twitter and everything else. And that if it puts them off, um, women, you know, entering the public sphere. That's do you think that's more of an issue during the lock, during this particular crisis. Well, um, it's, you know, because clearly you have a lot of very sort of qualified women. It may be that there's also because you're, you're getting, you know, that there's always the pipeline issue. So, uh, you know, I would hope that there's a lot of young female, you know, virologists and so on in this field sort of coming through. Um, certainly that, that, the, that the, the scientists themselves um, of the, the most sort of experienced and senior sort of seem to be male um, dominated, so that may, as I say, that that just may be that the that's a historic, um, that's a historic thing. But I think um, you know I, I I'm I'm certainly aware that we we had more women before, and I hope that we'll have more women after. Um, and I think, as I say, I think there are those, those sort of two things. One is um, one is the sheer multitasking that seems to go on, and the and the second is a sort of um, is a reluctance um, to to think that they're, you know, that their view, men are much, much happier to um, give expert views. You know, women seem to, and sometimes as we have we seen in the past, you know, women were right to be more cautious. Um, but I think that's it, it is an issue. Yeah. I'd be really interested to see the data from the BBC 50, 50 project. Yeah. Yeah. Um, question about, you talked about audiences and, um, and you know, your audience being seen as elite, but actually being fairly wide ranging. And Jarko um, from Finland is asking about how about younger audiences and what's your, what's your strategy been? Have you had a strategy for reaching younger audiences and was it successful? Um, yes, what I try to do is to think that you, you, you still have to, there are certain things that are demanded of the programme. So you have to have an interest in current affairs and, and, and politics. So, um, uh, so where would you go to look for that? And that tended to be for a start amongst people studying that stuff, you know, so universities and so on were, were something actually that I started doing quite a lot. It was one thing, one of the things that annoyed the government, by the way, um, was doing, um, uh, having a relationship with the universities, doing university broadcasts, we set up some student media awards. Um, and so also, you know, producing very good stories so that we, we have some very, very talented student uh, journalists coming out of, of that working on the Today program. Why did that, so that annoy was, the government? Sorry? Why did that annoy the government? Uh, they had, uh, if, if you remember, that they, um, they were irritated with the universities because they thought they were part of the bias, right. um, that they, it was particularly over the, over the sort of Brexit issue. Um, so that was one thing that, uh, Rob, uh, that my friend Robbie Gibb had raised specifically is why do you talk to the universities so much? Um, so that an assumption that there would be a sort of set of views that came out of universities. Um, but so that, so that's worked quite well. And then I think, um, um, actually the, during the, during the COVID crisis is one sort of small thing we've tried to do to, um, just, you know, bear in mind, um, the kind, um, ha the different ways in people are, um, suffering on this is all those, um, people who are out of work, who should be performing. Um, and so we've done a little, um, the show must go on slot at the end of, of, of each programme. Um, and again, that, that tends to sort of bring um, quite a lot of, um, of those, you know, young sort of furlough, furloughed performers who one really um, fears for, um, who, who, so at least it's giving them a sort of platform. But I think generally, um, you know, being aware of sort of tone and perspective and, 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 and interest, and we know that some stories actually, you know, what's going on in America now, 
um, over the um, over the race rebellion is uh, you know is something that's a sort of particular that young people feel strongly about. I think my daughter's out protesting now, so you know you know where you know whether where those kind of subjects are, which we'd cover anyway, but um, to, you know just to bear in mind. Okay, I mean. That kind of takes us nicely to a question I was reading from um, Daniel Pinhurst, a journalist of us from Brazil, and this is a question we've been asking everybody really, that when you have people like Trump and Bolsonaro tweeting misinformation, lies, you know, incitement, there's a huge ethical debate on whether you cover it or not, and, and if so, how? Um, and what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think one thing about the, the Today programme is I would think above all, I want it to be a sort of rational forum. Um, so I think you, you must cover and interrogate. That would be my, um, that, that would always be my, you know, you, you, you can't sort of ignore it because, um, uh, you know, because he's president of the United States. Um, but um, you can interrogate it. And actually, um, one thing that the head of news um, uh, before Fran, it was James Harding, who'd left to go and do tortoise, I'm sure you um, probably had him at the Reuters Institute. Um, but so he set up a whole idea of the sort of reality check, which actually was rather um, prescient as it turned out. You know, so that sense that when someone says something, and actually it's working very well at COVID, the programme that's doing incredibly well is more or less on Radio 4, which just takes the um, facts and figures and the data and um, interrogates and analyses them. And I think that becomes incredibly important. So what you can't do is just let things stand. You know, you have to, so, so you, you run those quotes and then you interrogate and analyze and contextualize and have other people talking about it. It means that the program needs to be carefully orchestrated. And one thing particularly that's actually always, um, that I've thought about on that program is because it's three hours long, and I think of it as a sort of um, in total, um, <clears throat> but if you're only listening to something at one bit of the program, you might just hear that and then not the balancing part later and I notice most of the complaints I get about bias is because people haven't heard the balancing element <clears throat> so I think that um, one has to be careful about making sure that that's you know exact in the right place and so on that's a that, that's something that I had the balance was up front that you say early on there will be another yes exactly yeah is there and um is there a list, is, is there a list, either a public or private list of banned people or organisations who'd never be invited on? For example, Britain First or Tommy, Tommy Robinson. This is from Richard Allen, who's again one of our listing fellows. Yes, one wouldn't, um, there isn't a banned list, as, as, um, uh, one doesn't exist, but one would think carefully about what the, you know, purpose and the merit is. So you wouldn't do it sort of um, frivolously, but I still think, you know, on the whole, you know, shine a light sort of thing. So let people be heard and then interrogate them very well. And we do have, we do have the setup for that on the Today programme. You know, you've got extremely experienced presenters, you've got this sort of fabulous team standing behind them. Um, so it would be, um, so you, what you sh shouldn't let people have is just a sort of, you know, free hit or, a, or a, um, a, an unchallenged platform. Um, and that is something, of course, that's more of a problem with such a social media or, or the new um you know that the what people in power are finding is by bypassing the media and um or the mainstream media and just putting out their own version of events of course what you don't get is challenge um so i do think actually the role of something like the today program becomes incredibly important when you do have um people with views that um need to be challenged in putting back a little bit to the kind of why the BBC, this isn't a question about the Today programme, I know, but about Emily Maitlis, and this from Jane Corskadden. Um, do you think that the criticism of Emily Maitlis was fair, considering the adversarial questioning style of Jeremy Paxman, the one that you mentioned, the why, why is his lying bastard lying to me style, uh, which was completely accepted on Newsnight? Do you think the criticism of Maitlis was fair? It's uh, fortunately not my decision and uh, it's, it's a, a BBC issue. I think they would say that they were talking about it sort of crossing the line between news and comment on it. It, it wasn't a question, was it? It was a, it was a, it was a statement. You know, it was an introduction. Was an introduction. Yes. Um, so I, so, so they have very strict guidelines and that was their decision. But, um, but I think it's an interesting point on, on interviewing styles and whether, whether women are sometimes judged differently, I think is an interesting issue. And um, going back to the issue of balance um, from Peter Burke, and this is kind of a, an ongoing question in the debate about where you do balance. And there's been a belated acceptance that in climate change deniers, for example, don't merit the same airtime as climate change scientists. Um, could the same be applied to Brexit? 
Do 95% economists on the Remain side deserve equal time to five on the Leave side? And does the Today programme regret having applied to that policy if it did? Uh, what are too many experts? Kind of balance being what what we now call false equivalence on the climate yeah. change science and did that do you think that applied in in the Brexit debate? I think it's um, when one talks about Brexit now it's happened you know so anything we do now is to do with what sort of economy you build and um, and I think. Um, uh, so I think those arguments are sort of of the past. Fortunately, I was not at the BBC doing the referendum, so I don't have to, uh, I, I don't need a view on that. It looked to me sort of, it looked to me pretty well balanced. And you're, uh, also you're talking about different, um, for, you know, you're talking about sort of different perspectives and um, you're talking about heart and head and all sorts of things. So quite difficult to, um, to marry that all up. But it's an interesting thing that, that still, um, you know, a lot of the sort of fault lines you see um, in, a, in opinion and um, the sort of polarisation uh, on lots of issues but seem to come, seem to be on similar lines to, you know, to what happened um, during the referendum. So um, I'm not sure it sort of totally seems to be quite healed yet. But I do think, certainly for us, we're kind of, you know, that's sort of behind this now. We're not going to rehearse all those arguments. You know, it's happened and now you, now you need to look at... Um, uh, at what happens next. And on that note, um, how are you currently mixing the programming? Because till very recently, COVID-19 has been the only story in town for most media outlets. And now we've ha we have the, well, we have the awful events in the United States, mm. but also kind of sense that the news cycle everywhere is resuming and people need to know about other things. So how are you, how you, make, how are you striking that balance? And also how, how do you generally strike a balance between domestic news and international news? Yeah, that's, I mean, I think you, that it's our job to um, reflect what's going on in the world. And there is, as you will know from news, there's a, um, there's a sort of feel of what feels right. So you kind of know that somehow, you know, you knew on Friday night and Saturday that, you know, what was happening in America was, was the thing. You know, so I think um, I, I've always, um, well, from newspapers particularly because one wasn't as accountable as in um, at the BBC, you know, you just kind of, you you follow hunches you know so um that just felt um felt important and it is interesting how other subjects are, are um are now playing you know hong kong um it would be interesting to see when i, I think some of the th some of the things that of course would worry people is whether you can only take so much bad news and so anything happening you know so when you're looking for contrast you're having to look for um something jolly when something actually very important and sad may be happening elsewhere and so on. But I think, um, um, I, you know, I, I'm delighted that we are able now to open up a bit to, to other subjects. Um, it's a, I mean, climate is an interesting one because of course that, you know, was very dominating and then became less so. So I would imagine one could return to that, um, you know, in all honesty, but it's funny, something like space, of course, you know, was one that somehow, it wasn't sort of jarring. It was, you know, it was really interesting to talk to talk about. Um, you know, everyone was watching the sky. So it's, it's interesting how the subjects that sort of fit at the moment um, without seeming that you're being sort of disrespectful in some, some way about what's happening in COVID. But, but I think it would be nice. I, I'm certainly looking forward to opening up to some other subjects. And I think also the economy will beco is becoming, you know, increasingly um, I think it was described by one of the guests today as the sort of the um, economic pandemic. And I think that will that will take up a lot of attention. Having worked kind of at newspapers and then gone on to radio, which which do you think is the kind of better media of conveying big, complex stories? Kind That's of really print, good the written word, I won't say print because print is dying, but the written word or, or audio or does it depend on the viewer? It's a really interesting question because I think, you know, what I love about the radio and particularly the BBC is that sense, you know, it's on the record, it's, um, you know, it's verified, it's there. Um, sometimes and people still, you know, all newspaper colleagues who haven't quite sort of got, will phone me go, there's a really interesting story, you know, so and, so, and they say, oh, so who can we get to say it? And they'll go, oh no, well, they won't say it. And I went, then I can't do it. <laughs> you know, so, um, so I still miss and I always read those, particularly the sort of long form articles, you know, you get in the Sunday Times or the Sunday papers, you know, that really kind of map out stuff and you have anonymous quotes, but you trust the journalist so you know it's, so I read a lot of, um, yeah, long form pieces um, that are very difficult to do um, 
in uh, uh, on radio and it and it's interesting that some actually the covid essays were an example that in a way that was a sort of uh, i was i was reminded of after 9 11 there were some just really really strong accounts of you know by sort of witness accounts you know that became um a sort of body of work um and so i i was thinking of those when i was commissioning for for radio but you see, I immediately get into trouble because it's the BBC, so first it turns into a big rap, and then you're part of it. Um, and, uh, um, and possibly they work better as written pieces. Um, I, 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 I like those sort of voice pieces, but I think that's, that's what I miss is, the, is a bit of time for things to, um, uh, to roll out, for stories to be told in a, in a, in a properly you know, researched way um, and without intervention to... Yeah. But it's interesting, but you'd mentioned the anonymous briefings and, you know, on, on in, in, you know, if, you're, if it's a written article, you can have yeah. briefings and not have someone say it. And it's, it's interesting, the government, you, you kind of had a very public standoff with the government, but then the battle was fa carried out through off the record briefings on to, for the mail on Sunday. Yeah, exactly. No, newspapers have had, and Tim, people like Tim Shipman, you know, yeah. ha, ha, that's been absolutely, um, it's worked incredibly well for them because everyone wants to get their account. And of course, at the moment, um, as happened over Brexit, you know, over COVID, everyone will want their account to, you know, they, they want to look okay at the end of it. So I'd imagine there's a ton of briefing going on um, and you want someone to be able to sift all that and, um, you know, and, and to do the next. I look forward to the first journalist um, COVID book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I have one last question to everyone. So you're stepping down from the Today programme in September. And what are you, you know, where, where are you off to? Will you miss it? I'll miss it very much. Um, I won't miss the hours particularly, but I I'll really miss the team. You know, they have they are the most professional, um, superb team, um, and I'll miss them very much. And I'll miss the sense of um, you know astonishingly being at the centre of, of of events in the way that you are in that program and that. Um, so I'll so I'll miss all that. But um, I would like to go back and do a bit more um, writing and a bit more. Um, working and sort of ideas and um that's so that's that's the plan well thank you so much we can't wait to read what you could produce after this as well but thank you so much <laughs> and um thanks for joining us and thank you everybody as well thank you so much thank you very much indeed thank you, thank you. have a good afternoon